Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Halliday. Today's show is a special mineral resources edition because our guest today is Mr. Rick Rule. Rick is one of our favorite market commentators and equity analysts. He is the president and CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings. He is also the founder of Global Resources Investments. Rick is an internationally acclaimed expert on the financial, precious metals, and commodities markets. We're excited to have him on the show today with everything that has happened in all of the markets. Rick, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Yes, we are excited to have you here. We want to start right off by focusing in upon what is happening in the TSX Venture Exchange. Rick, the numbers have been crazy over the past years. This exchange has gone from 3,345 points back in May of 2007 down to 700 points in November of 2008. Then it rebounded fast to 2375 in 2011. And now to start off 2020, it is down to 584 points. This crash is an 83% crash in 13 years. Rick, is this considered to be normal or is this an exchange to be completely avoided? What is your analysis of what is happening here? It's important to look at the Toronto Stock, Ex- Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Exchange for what it is, which is a listed venture capital market. It's important, too, to look at the, the sub-indexes, the components of the exchange. That exchange is a very resource-centric exchange. And the market for natural resource investments and speculations was spectacular in the decade which preceded the last decade. That is, in the period from 2000 to 2010, the same index that you talk about would have been up fivefold or sixfold. The consequence of natural resources losing favor in the decade 2010 to 2020 meant that the sector that had given that exchange its impetus caused it to lose impetus. The sub-index around uh, natural resources was actually a more dramatic loser, losing 87% of price over that same period of time. Some of the recovery that you saw in the index was a bit illusory, as that index, the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Index, was the leading index in the world in the nascent cannabis industry. So if if you looked at the whole index, the performance was actually worse than it appears. Now, of course, that that black cloud has a wonderful silver lining. If, in fact, you are a resource industry investor or a resource industry speculator, you will either know or come to know that these businesses are capital intensive and cyclical, and that in order to make money, you must be a contrarian or you will be a victim. The truth is, in resource businesses, when they are dramatically oversold, they're setting themselves up for a spectacular rebound for the simple reason that without mine or grown commodities, nothing on earth that is tangible continues to exist. So I think what you're seeing in that market, and I'm not saying that somebody should buy or or even look at all all of the stocks on that exchange, But what you're looking at in financial terms is what you would call a sale or at physical goods on offer. If you went to buy clothes and you saw a coat or a dress that you liked and you noticed that it was 85% off the price that you could have bought it for two years ago, you'd think that was a great deal. But for some reason, because we're stocks, because they're stocks, we shop for them differently. So think of a bear market simply as a sale. And you'll understand them well. Right. Golden opportunity. Now, Rick, what are the common traits that you see in the investments that have really worked out well for you personally, specifically in the mining sector? I want to point out something that you alluded to just now. You have often said, and it's very interesting, you have said that it has nearly never happened that an investment did not go down by 50% before making a winning surge 
of a rebound. So I want you to go into that a little bit more for us because you alluded to that a moment ago, but it's very important. Well, you've asked a lot of important questions there, so I'll try to unpack it. The most important trend, trait, pardon me, in a speculative company rather than an investment grade company, in a speculative company, the most important assets are the people. So I try and back the very, very best people, and I hold them for reasonably long periods of time. The second tenet is that uh, both investments and speculations generally take longer to play out than investors uh, would hope for. We think that our time preference, the fact that we want to be rewarded quickly, is important, (laughs) but it isn't. (laughs) Uh, I I will tell you that in many allocations I have made, both speculative and investments, uh, I have had to suffer through downturns before the upturns. As an example, I've owned Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's famous company, since 1982. Four times during the period that I have held that stock, it has fallen by 35% or more in an 18-month time frame. Suffering through those declines is psychologically punishing. Yet, if you look at a stock chart of Berkshire Hathaway going from the period 1982 to today, those four 35% plus declines can't even be seen on the stock chart. They come to be irrelevant over four decades, although they're psychologically punishing as they occur. Similarly, in uh, speculative positions that I have held, which while riskier have generated even larger gains for me, when I look at the positions, the speculative positions that I've had in my portfolio that have gone more than 10 to 1, that is, they have increased by more than 1,000%, In almost every circumstance, I had to endure a 12-month period where the position was down by half, meaning you have a $2 stock that goes to a dollar stock, but then over the next five years, it goes to $20. Uh, You need to have enough courage in your interpretation of the company's value that you aren't too disturbed by what it does in terms of price remembering that price is what you pay and value is what you get. Right. Now, in terms of Sprott's investments, I know that you've been investing in Ross Beatty's companies, such as the original Lumina Copper. You've also invested in Gold Mining Inc., which is headed up by Amir Adnani. You've spoken very highly of Mr. Nani. So when you think of investments going forward, what do you feel is valuable about the investments of his company, for instance, and why would you choose that over another company? What are your thought processes there? In building speculative companies, the uh, perseverance and tenacity of the chief executive officer and the investment acumen of the chief investment officer is often the most important determinant of success. I have been involved over 40 years in, if my memory serves me well, 14 of Ross Beatty's companies. And I can say that my association with Ross Beatty feels to me like I owned a row of slot machines. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, he has just paid and paid and paid and paid. And one of the things that I began to do 10 years ago is identify uh, the younger generation of financiers and try and determine a few who could treat me as well as Ross Beatty, Robert Friedland, uh, Lucas Lundin, the sort of the people from my generation who made my early career. And Amir Adnani is one of those. Amir Adnani is a guy in his uh, mid-40s who is young enough that he doesn't have the premium associated with his name that Ross Beatty might but exhibits the same persistence, the same tenacity, the same brilliance. At the same time, Amir Adnani understands the value of building a personal financial brand. So Amir has probably spent 15 or $20 million in the last 10 years in his companies on financial public relations. That doesn't show up in the balance sheet, but it does show up in the sense that he has in Gold Mining Inc. probably 40,000 committed retail shareholders. And that's important because as the gold price goes up, 
uh, and those people are looking for places to commit additional funds, Amir Adnani, like Ross Beatty, will have mind share. He will have a personal franchise that will attract capital. And because he has that mind share, when good opportunities come, he will be in a position to attract those good opportunities because the people who have those opportunities, who are looking to a financier to advance them, will necessarily choose him rather than somebody who is less well known. So there's this wonderful virtuous circle around financiers who have proven themselves, who are persistent, who are tenacious, and have good reputations both with investors and within the industry. And Amir Adnani is one of the, uh, pardon my phrase, but youngsters uh, in that group of investors. So it all comes down to the people. It does come down to the people. It, I mean, of course, the opportunity is important, but people with good reputations get access to better opportunities. That's what I'm saying. It's a virtuous circle. If there is a, if there's an investment group out there that has an asset that they need to advance and they need capital, when they are searching for a financing partner, they will naturally gravitate to a Ross Beer, Ross Beatty, pardon me, or an Amir Adnani because they know that those people will have access to the capital and will have the perseverance necessary to advance that uh, asset for the benefit of all. Now, speaking about investors in general, Rick, what is the best way for a non-accredited investor, in other words, everyday individuals who are not part of or do not have access to private placements, to become part of the resource mining sector? The easiest thing, uh, I think, for non-accredited investors, younger investors to do, is to educate themselves there are hundreds of hours of educational material online now. Uh, I would urge as an investor, as an example, young investors to go to SprottGlobal.com and Sprott Media, where there are probably 200 hours of instructional material. Educate yourself, that is spend the time before you spend the money. And in particular, study good investors and study the names that good investors invest in. Younger investors who confine their investments in the resource sector, as an example, to companies that are run by the 20 best resource financiers in the world will do well. The second thing that younger investors need to do, and this is critical, is remember this slogan. In resources, you are either a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. When a commodity, when a sector is out of favor, it is cheap. It is that very sense of cheap that sets out the rebound. The truth is that bear markets are the authors of bull markets and bull markets are the authors of bear markets. Young investors in particular are narrative oriented. And if you're narrative oriented rather than arithmetically oriented, the fact that a, that a sector has moved up in price, which actually makes it more risky, uh, makes it appear more attractive. Think about this, or this piece of arithmetic. If a, if a share price goes from $2 to $4, but nothing has changed with the fundamentals of the company, despite the fact that you feel good about the share price escalation, in an arithmetic sense, the company is precisely half as attractive. By contrast, if the stock has gone from $4 to $2, but nothing has changed, the company is arithmetically twice as attractive. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. You make money on the delta between price and value. Right, right. Warren Buffett says the trick is to buy low and sell high, but it's so hard to do because you see it escalating. You're like, I got to get in there. I got to get in there. And then it drops. <laughs> I, I would encourage people to think about financial assets the way that they feel about physical assets. If you understand something about what something's worth to you, let's go back to my prior example, a coat. I don't know how many coats you've bought in your career, but probably enough 
that you have sort of some sense of what a coat might be worth to you in the winter. And if there was a coat that you found to be warm and also attractive, and you felt that uh, at whatever sort of place you shop, that your expectation was that you would pay $200 for that coat, if you were able to buy that coat for $100, you might find that extremely attractive. If you went to a different merchant and you saw that coat on sale for $400, you would think that you were being abused. If you take that same common sense approach to financial assets, this asset in my own mind is worth X. If I can get the asset for 60% of X, I'm happy. If I have to pay 200% of X, I'm being abused. You will do better. It's odd that in financial assets, people pay slavish attention to price and not much attention to value. If you apply the same discipline to financial assets that you do fiscal assets, you'll be a better investor. Yes. It takes so much self-control to do that, too, because you have to realize that when it's dropping, it's the time to buy. It's not the time to panic. And it's almost the reverse emotional reaction, I think. Michelle, it's important <clears throat> that people develop a sense of what, if somebody is looking at buying shares in a company, it's important to recognize that those shares represent fractional ownership in the business. So it's very important to have a sense of the value of the business. Having a sense of the value is much more important than any knowledge of its price because only by understanding the value will you have a frame of reference for the price. Now, price information is easy to obtain and hence people favor it <laughs> over information regarding value, which is much more difficult to, to obtain. But the truth is that you don't have to get value right you just have to be better at it than other people in order to make money in the market. Right. <laughs> Let's focus in on the price of gold, Rick. It okay. bottomed out in December of 2015, a little more than four years ago, and now it's up by 50%. In 2016, it was remarkable for gold stocks until August, and since then, until April 2019, it did take a sharp downturn. In the past eight months, we are seeing a comeback, but what brings investors to this industry and what type of investor actually moves the mining sector? Let's draw a distinction to begin with between gold and gold stocks because they're different, albeit related asset classes. Traditionally, and by traditionally, I mean for probably a thousand years, Gold has moved as a consequence of people's lack of faith in other mediums of exchange or stores of value. When there is confidence, as an example, in the, in the economy, in the U.S. dollar, and in the U.S. dollar as a savings instrument, as expressed by the U.S. 10-year treasury, gold does poorly. Gold does well when people believe that the purchasing power over time of fiat currencies and government bonds is in question. Gold is doing well now because people are increasingly concerned about the value afforded by, as an example, the U.S. 10-year treasury. And interestingly, although people are nervous about the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar is outperforming other currencies. I will tell you personally that it's my belief that the U.S. dollar is doing well, not because of some huge strength in the U.S. economy, and certainly not because the U.S. government's balance sheet looks good, but rather because the weakness in competing currencies, the weakness in the yen, the weakness in the euro, the weakness in the renminbi, uh, is what many people believe is causing dollar strength today. I'm among them. My friend Doug Casey went so far as to call the U.S. dollar the prettiest mare at the slaughterhouse. Uh, that's a bit extreme, probably. But let's look as an example at the value proposition offered up by the U.S. 10-year treasury, the world's benchmark savings industry, pardon me, savings instrument. 
The uh, 10 year yields uh, as of this morning about 1.87%. So if you give the US government your money for 10 years, they promise to pay you 1.87%. Uh, okay, versus other savings instruments. But if you look at it absolutely, the Congressional Budget Office suggests that inflation in the United States is running at 1.6%, which is a different way of saying that the purchasing power of the dollar is degrading by 1.6% compounded. So if you give the government your money for 10 years, they promise to pay you about one quarter of 1% in real interest a year. That low interest rate relative to the depreciation of the dollar has caused my friend Jim Grant to describe 10-year treasuries as, quote, return free risk. Think about the concept of return free risk. Gold is doing well because an increasing number of investors, including generalists, uh, the Dalios and Druckenmeyers of the world, are saying, you know what, the money that you are paid for storing your money with the US government is insufficient given the risk. Many of your listeners, particularly the younger ones, who have grown up during a period of time where the US economy has gone from strength to strength, pay too much attention to the American narrative and not enough time to American arithmetic. So separate and apart from the fact that the yield is paltry, let's look at the quality of the creditor, the person who's the entity that's supposed to pay you. The uh, US government has on balance sheet obligations of about $22 trillion. That is, there's $22 trillion in bonds outstanding. Your younger viewers should note that that's 12 zeros. A trillion is a very, 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 very big number. And then there's off-balance sheet liabilities. Off-balance sheet liabilities are promises to pay. Your viewers should look in the camera and see me. I'm 67 years old. I'm an off-balance sheet liability. Your generation has to pay me Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. There's all these wonderful things that my generation has voted for ourselves but forgot to pay for. So we've decided that you get to pay it for us. So if you look at the total obligations of the United States, just at the federal level, it's $120 trillion. That's what you owe. So if you owe a U.S. 10-year treasury, you are this part of this $120 trillion pool of obligations. So how do we service this debt? Well, that's the national income. Taxes and fees, less expenses. The problem is that the income stream that we intend to use to pay this $120 trillion in obligations is negative. We're losing a trillion for a year. Now, I know that you had a better mathematics education than I did because you're younger than I am. But the truth is there's no form of new math that can allow you to add a column of negative numbers and come up with a positive sum, which is a different way of saying that ultimately that debt is unserviceable. And it is the sense that the yield on debt is too low and the risk on debt is too high that is causing some people to put some amount of their wealth in gold. It's insurance against the arithmetic behind the U.S. dollar and the U.S. 10-year treasury. Gold stocks are a little different. I look at gold as insurance. People buy gold because they're afraid of the diminution of the purchasing power of the dollar. People buy gold stocks because they think as investments, as businesses, they will prosper with higher gold prices. In other words, if you're looking for stronger economic performance, you upgrade yourself from gold, which is a cautious asset, to gold stocks, which are a more aggressive asset. And this is an interesting time for that, too. If your viewers are interested, they can email me, and I'll give you my email address at the end of the interview. Uh, we have a 40-year gold mining stock index chart. It's the Barron's Gold Mining uh, Index. 
And what that chart shows you is several interesting things. The first is, and referencing back to your Toronto Stock Exchange venture performance, <clears throat> the uh, equity index associated with gold, in, with, uh, gold stocks uh, is at or near uh, a 40-year low, meaning that these stocks are about as cheap in real terms as they have ever been. The chart will show you that we're approaching the bottom at the bottom or just off the bottom in a 40-year context. It will also show you that there have been nine major recoveries from oversold bottoms in gold equities. And those, those recoveries for the index, not just for individual stocks, but for the index, have varied between 180% gain to a 1,200% gain over periods of time as short as 17 months and as long as 46 months. So if history is our guide, what the gold mining stock index tells you is that we are about as cheap as we have ever been. And the recovery uh, will be somewhere between 180% and 1200%. From my point of view, this is not an unattractive proposition particularly because I understand uh, looking at the competition for gold, uh, the so-called return-free risk, that there is in my mind a probability that gold does well, and hence that the gold stocks should do well. So this is a spectacular moment in time. Uh, in time is a great phrase. Could this take a year? Sure. Could it take two years? Suppose it took two years, and at the end of two years, you had the type of recovery that was the worst recovery in the last 40, meaning that you waited two years to get into a market that gave you 180% return. Not particularly unattractive. Let's say, rather than that, that you had sort of a median return, four or 500%. Not unattractive either. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that your viewers sell their house, sell their blue chips, mm -hmm. cash in their savings deposits, and buy gold. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. I'm suggesting that gold and gold stocks have an appropriate place in most portfolios, particularly when the evidence shows that the circumstance that has traditionally made gold do well are in place and where history also shows that gold stocks, which are leveraged to gold, uh, are at or approaching their lowest point in 40 years. So if you recognize it, this is really a fortunate period of time. Now, Rick, do you believe that there's a correlation between the phase one trade deal between the United States and China and the trend in the U.S. dollar and the price of industrial metals? No, uh, or if there is, I think it's extremely muted. Um, the, uh, I, I think, first of all, the trade deal is superficial. You know, Michelle, if you and I wanted to have a free trade agreement between us, we could do it in a paragraph. That paragraph would say there will be, be no legal impediments between free individuals willingly buying and selling goods and services. Stop. A 3,000-page agreement has nothing to do with free trade. It has everything to do with managed trade. And in my experience, the more that governments interfere with the free exchange of goods and services between people, the less rich everyone becomes. So I see no particular good in discussions between Trump and Xi because neither of them care too much <laughs> about the benefits that an agreement might convey to their citizens. And they care more uh, about political gains at the expense of each other. My hope is that uh, economies in both countries can survive the political leadership. <laughs> I feel very good about the ascent of man. Uh, I feel very good about the fact that in the last 30 years, the two billion poorest people on earth have become less poor more rapidly than at any prior time in human history. I feel great uh, about the urbanization of China 
and the occasional willingness of the Chinese leadership to allow Chinese people to become more free and hence richer. Uh, I feel great about the education that your generation has received relative to the, gener the education that my generation has received. And I feel great about the compound benefits of technology. Uh, I don't feel good about political leadership of any stripe. With regards to industrial materials and base metals, they're going to be extremely uh, sensitive to the economy. And I should tell you, I probably don't have to tell you, you can probably tell by listening, I'm no economist. Uh, I'm a credit analyst. But I would point out that the economic recovery that we are now enjoying, as tepid as it is, has been around for about 10 years. And in my experience, a 10-year recovery is extremely long of tooth. So while I'm not calling for an immediate recession, because I'm not smart enough to do that, I'm a little nervous about industrial materials, the coppers and the oil and gas uh, industries of the world, simply because if we go into a synchronized global economic slowdown, it would postpone a recovery in those materials. What commodity are you super bullish on right now, if any? In the very near term, uh, I like precious metals. Um, I see the wind in gold sails. Um, and uh, people who haven't experienced gold bull markets don't understand how dramatic they are. I'm not saying that one is for sure going to happen, and if it does happen, I'm not saying when it will happen, but I am telling you that it is a probability rather than a possibility. The odds are more than 50% in my opinion. And the dramatic nature of prior recoveries tells me that if I can make a bet on a probability uh, with the upside potential that first gold and then silver has, that I do myself a disservice not participating in it. So in sort of order, uh, gold, gold stocks, silver then moves. Silver has always moved later than gold, but it moves further. It's more volatile and its unit value is less, so more people can participate. And then finally, silver stocks. The population of high quality silver stocks in the world is very limited. And in my experience, when they start to move, when their momentum justifies the narrative, the flood of money into the available market cap to hold that money generates tremendous, <laughs> tremendous gains. Uh, quoting Doug Casey again, when the generalist investor tries to crowd into silver stocks, it resembles attempting to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. So for those people who are patient and are risk tolerant, looking at the higher quality silver names, understanding it could take two years for them to move, uh, is probably the best available speculation at this point in time. The second commodity that I would draw your your uh, investors' attention to, probably none of them will take me up on this, uh, would be uranium. Uh, I can't tell you when uranium will go up, but it's almost certain that it will. The, the reason for that is that it's being produced for less than the cost, it's being sold, pardon me, for less than the cost of production. On a global basis, we make the stuff for about $50 a pound including cost of capital, prior year write-downs, exploration. So we make it for 50 and we sell it for 25. We lose $25 a pound, 100 million times a year. And it's getting boring. <laughs> uh, either the price goes up or we stop producing uranium. And uranium, even in countries that can afford not to use it, countries that hate it, like the United States, uranium is 15% of our baseload power. So if you look out six or seven years, the question is simple. Either the price of uranium goes up to the cost of production or the lights go out. And your listeners or subscribers have to ask themselves, which outcome is more probable? Could the price of uranium go from 25 to 50 or will the lights go out? My suspicion is it is door A. Now, I can't tell you if this happens a year from now or two years from now. What I can tell you is that the 2001, 2002, 2000 through 2006 bull market in uranium and uranium stocks 
was the single most lucrative financial event of my career. And as the uranium price begins to recover, when it recovers, and I have no idea where, when that will be, the sort of 10 or 12 reasonable quality uranium stocks on the planet could be expected to do extraordinarily well. Giving you a historic note, in 2001, there were five uranium juniors in the world. Uh, a portfolio consisting of those five stocks <laughs> would have uh, given you a portfolio where the worst of the five, the poorest performing of the five, over the next five years, generated 22 to 1 returns. I'm not saying that the returns that you'll get this time will match that, but I am telling you that markets have memories. And if the uranium market turns around, or whether when the uranium market turns around, the flow of funds into those few uranium juniors will be, pardon the pun, explosive. Now, this is really interesting that it's um, sold for less than it takes to mine it. Name a few things that uranium is actually used for, for everybody. The most important thing that uranium is used for is generating electricity. Um, you know, there are people who will listen to this interview and they will say, you know, that Rick Rule is a despicable human being. He's asking me to speculate on Fukushima, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, and Three Mile Island. Mm. That isn't actually what I'm asking them to do. The safety track record of uranium relative to most other forms of energy is extremely good. What I'm asking you to do is speculate on whether you think the lights will go on five years from now or six years from now or seven years from now. There's this narrative that says that the world should run on wind and solar. The problem is that it can't. The, the power supply is too unreliable. You know, the wind doesn't always blow. With regards to solar, there's this weird thing called night, uh, which makes solar sort of inconsistent. To live the way that we live requires a multiplicity of energy sources, including, of course, wind or solar. But if you think about the fact that nuclear, even in a country that's trying to phase out nuclear like the United States, provides 15% of baseload power, it tells you that it's absolutely certain, if your listeners think it's desirable that the light goes on and their computer works, <laughs> that uh, uranium have a place uh, in the sort of portfolio of power generation. The... Um, Utilities in the United States suggest that a 3% degradation in baseload supply, that is a diminution of baseload supply by 3%, is enough to cause rolling blackouts. So when I say that uranium provides 15% of baseload power, take it in the context of how fragile our electricity grid actually is to reductions in supply. Yeah, it's amazing how fragile many of the structures that we really right. depend upon are right. fragile. But um, it's very interesting about uranium. You know, Rick, please talk to us briefly about your company, Sprott, for anyone who's not familiar with it, about what it does and what it is. Sprott is a uh, Canadian-listed and domiciled company. The symbol is SII on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And we uh, manage investments uh, on behalf of both retail and institutional investors and make investments in precious metals and natural resources. Among other things, we manage about six and a half billion dollars worth of physical precious metals in exchange-traded trusts on the New York Stock Exchange. We have the Sprott Physical Gold and Silver Trust, then a gold trust, an exclusively gold trust, a silver trust, and a platinum and palladium trust. In addition, uh, we are one of the largest lenders to the mining industry for the construction of new built mines, and we manage about $3 billion in natural resource equities on behalf of institutional and retail investors. Many of your audience uh, who are interested in the gold business will remember John Hathaway and the Tocqueville Group of Gold Mutual Funds. 
Uh, that's the latest addition to the Sprott family. We're delighted to have John Hathaway and the Tocqueville team uh, over here at home <laughs> in Sprott, where they always should have been. So we're involved in managing people's money in precious metals and natural resources. We're also involved in retail wealth management uh, for U.S. and Canadian investors in natural resources and precious metals. In fact, I'd like to offer your viewers uh, an inducement to get to know more about Sprott. Any of your viewers who would like to learn more about their own natural resource portfolios are invited to email me personally at rankings, R-A-N-K-I-N-G-S, at SprottGlobal.com. That's rankings at SprottGlobal.com. Include in the text of your email the name and symbol of every company in your natural resource portfolio, or at least every company that you would like a comment on, and I personally will rank those stocks, one to ten, one being best, ten being worst, and comment on those when it, where it's appropriate. This is an absolutely no obligation offer. But if you want to learn more about Sprott, the easiest thing for you to do is to get our considered opinion on the stocks that you already own. This will represent the collective wisdom of the 180 investment professionals in the Sprott network worldwide, including, of course, financial analysts, geologists, and engineers. That's extraordinary, Rick. Such a beautiful offer. Now, before we go, I want to mention to everybody, Rick has taken a very active personal interest in helping the wildlife that has been able to survive um, the devastating fires in Australia. For those who are not aware of the extent of what's taken place, it's estimated that over one billion animals have been killed in the past four months in these wildfires. And um, it's affected the populations of the koala bears, uh, the kangaroos, because their habitat has been destroyed. So not only have most of them been killed, but the ones that survive don't have anything to eat and uh, they're starving to death. There's a massive effort, Rick, underway that you have personally, and this is what I want our viewers to understand what this gentleman is all about. Um, he is the CEO and president of a huge company that he just described to you, and yet he is stepping up and he's inviting everyone to join him in helping this effort. And Rick, I just want you to take a moment to talk about what's happening here. Sure. I mean, you know, philanthropy is an important part of what we do. And we try to work as hard at philanthropy as we do at investing. There are good charitable causes and, frankly, bad charitable causes. Uh, we at Sprott have chosen to participate uh, in Australia's recovery, both human and natural recovery, through the Mindaroo Foundation. We've chosen the Mindaroo Foundation because, first of all, it stems from mining. Uh, it was started by Andrew Forrest, uh, a friend of mine and a person who I know to be of good character. But in terms of due diligence, the same sort of thing that we would do investing, uh, Mr. Forrest has, va has vowed to personally match our contribution dollar for dollar which means every dollar I put up becomes $2. Secondly, he has said that he will fund all of the general and administrative expense of the Mindaroo Foundation personally, which means that not even a penny of my dollar goes to GNA. It all goes to fire relief. And it goes to fire relief both in terms of habitat, which is very close to Mr. Uh, Mr. Forrest grew up uh, on a station, a ranch in rural Australia. So it's mm -hmm. extremely important. But it also goes to rural communities, including, of course, mining communities. At Sprott, we try to give back to communities who have made us the money that we're able to give back, and Australia has been important to us. You will note that we have been philanthropic in other areas, too. And in addition to looking at Australian relief, those uh, listeners and subscribers that you have uh, who have an interest in environmental philanthropy would do well to look at the Nature Conservancy and the BC Conservancy. They would do very well to look at Panthera, which is involved in big cat conservation worldwide. And again, where the general and administrative expense is funded by Tom Kaplan. So every dollar that you give goes into the ground. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we love groups like that. We, we love philanthropy 
that is attached to a really passionate individual. We talked early in the, earlier in this discussion about the fact that it's great people that make great companies. It's great people that make great philanthropies too. Adult supervision in place, somebody to make sure that the money doesn't get wasted. That is so key. That's why I wanted to bring this up because it's such a tragedy when things happen around the world in Puerto Rico or whatnot and you hear of billions of dollars going there and it was just gone and the people didn't even get it. This is an opportunity to really um, join in people that not only are caring but are very dedicated to giving every dollar toward what has happened. And it's a a tragic situation for anyone and uh, we, we, um, we honor you in everything you do around the world to help not just Australia, but all of the philanthropy that you've done. And I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention of this is the gentleman you're dealing with in terms of your money. So <laughs> it's always good to know the person. Well, thank, thank you. It's, it, it's been a pleasure for me to be able to. Yes, Rick, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everyone specifically how they can follow the philanthropic effort in Australia right now, and also how they can follow you and your team and repeat your email for everyone. Well, I have chosen to donate to the Mindaroo Foundation. Uh, I don't actually know the website, but Mindaroo is M-I-N-D-E-R-O-O. I'm sure if you Google Mindaroo, you'll see numerous references uh, from Andrew Forrest, who in addition to being uh, a billionaire businessman, is a pretty damn good promoter. Uh, that we, as I say, we have we have chosen that, but you will find other outlets if you care. Uh, I would repeat, if you want to avail yourself of my opinion of your resource holdings, that you email me those holdings, names and symbols in text, not as an attachment that my computer geeks won't let me open. Uh, to rankings, R A N K I N G S. Uh, In addition, for general education on mining and natural resources, our websites, which are www.sprott.com and www.sprottglobal.com and www.sprottusmedia.com have collectively about 200 hours of educational material on them for the best possible price, which is free. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Rick, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Always a pleasure. And thank you for the giving me the opportunity to run a little commercial for my Australian friends who are certainly in need today. Oh, always. Mr. Rick Rule, President and CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 